Pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America. And before we all sit down, I think it's proper and fitting for us to have a moment of silence for Supreme Justice Ruth Ginsburg. And I was just listening at uh, her bio the other day on TV. A small, sweet lady, very soft voice, very soft spoken. And she talked about how when she came out of law school, how. She could not do the job. She had three strikes against her. Number one, she was a mom. Number two, she was a mother. And number three, she was Jewish. And I said to myself, when are we going to stop looking at people about their nationality or wherever they came from? And just accept people as they are. And 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 uh, I simply would like to say to her family that we are praying for her and um, we wish them um, much support at the sad time. So could we just have a moment of silence, please? Thank you. Roll call, Kate. All right, thanks, Gladys. Uh, Joseph Britton is uh, absent at this time, expected later on the call. Rachel Cholesky. Here. Kate Canetta, here. Gladys Cooper. She's here. Lauren Daly. Here. Uh, Joe DeSilva. Present. Catherine Hodgson. Here. Rich Ginelli. Here. Kathy Molinero. Here. Al Russo. Here. Amy Spolina. Here. That's 10 present. And before we move on, we want to ask our board members to please uh, mute your uh, microphone until you get ready to speak, please. Uh, Dr. Sal, are you going to do the recognition at yes, this time? Yes, yes, yes. Is, is Mr. Walston here as well? Kevin, are you here? I'm here. Okay, great, because uh, he's been running the program. Well, uh, we have Dan here as well tonight. Uh, we're very proud, and Soroya uh, is no stranger to this board. She has been in front of us a number of times. She's just a real dynamo and has just been outreaching to students ever since she's been here, just doing the impossible things which really make her a hero. And then we have, we're fortunate to be able to recognize her. Kevin, do you want to update the board a little bit? Sure, sure. We, so we, so good, good evening, Board of Education. Uh, Becca, also good to see you as well. Um, so we have an opportunity to celebrate our 2019-2020 um, Teacher of the Year. Um, we had an opportunity to uh, survey the community during the spring uh, received a lot of feedback um, throughout the entire system and and teachers and, and, and families uh, recommending uh, staff members and quite frankly um, if there was every every year I, I recall being in a meeting with cabinet and if there was every year we needed to recognize all of our staff members the 1920 year uh, was one of them um, but we had one staff member in particular um, that really stood out amongst the rest, and we wanted to find an opportunity to make sure we celebrate that staff member. Um, to, to, to Dr. Sal's point, this is certainly not a stranger to the board or to the Danbury community. Um, she has uh, played a significant leadership role 
in our uh, bilingual pipeline program. We've had opportunities to uh, brag about this program, celebrate this program statewide. Um, it is, and, 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 and two, and given the investment, we now have um, our first graduate from that program after I believe eight, nine years invested, we had our first graduate in the program and is actually um, leading instruction in one of our classrooms at Pembroke Elementary School. And I, I think this is a significant tribute to Soraya, um, the partnerships he has uh, forged at um, WestCon. Um, and quite frankly, we are delighted to have her here this evening and celebrate her. I think Great. Dan, Dan Donovan, principal, has a yes, few sir. things to say. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, good evening. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to pre present Soraya Bilbao as the Teacher of the Year, recognition that is more than uh, deserved for her. Soraya's favorite quote is a personal model that she lives by is one person can make a, dish, a, a difference and everyone should try. And by the time I'm finished, you'll see uh, she tries to live up to that model in every possible way. Soraya is a English as a second language teacher at Danbury High School. This is her seventh year at DHS currently teaches the newcomers class, but has also taught ESL 1, ESL 2, and for two years she even taught uh, a curriculum of System 44, an online reading program for struggling readers. Uh, for many students coming to, into DHS for the first time, Soraya is the first person they come into contact with. She goes out of her way to make sure each one of them feels special and is welcomed, welcomes them with open arms. Soraya is always on the lookout for opportunities to encourage and help English learners achieve their dreams of attending college. Uh, in the 16-17 school year, Soraya launched an AP Spanish independent program for English learners at DHS. This weekly after-school study session provides ESL students who are native Spanish speakers the opportunity to take the AP Spanish exam as an independent study. Since its inception, 102 ESL students have taken the AP Spanish. That was not my phone. Of these, 65 scored three or higher, which is an impressive 64% pass rate. A 64% pass rate while only meeting once a week with these students. We need to let that one sit in for just a moment. Another outstanding program is, uh, which has Soraya's fingerprints all over it, as Kevin mentioned, uh, is the Building to Bridges and the Pipeline, uh, the Minority Pipeline program at WestCon. The Building Bridges to College program offered ESL students the opportunity to experience firsthand what it's like to attend college in the United States. The culmination of this program was 100 ESL students uh, who visited WestCon and spent the day with college representatives. Once it was over, uh, ESL students wrote things like, thank you, Dr. Sal and Ms. Balbell, because for for me, going on this trip was a unique experience that I love and will continue to strive to enter the university. Uh, another one wrote, I would like to thank you for the opportunity because I've never gone to a university in the United States and this was a great opportunity. From 2017 to 2020, Soraya took over the instructing, took over the role of instructing the minority teaching pipeline program at WestCon. Uh, this unique two semester college course offered minority and bilingual DHS students, the opportunity to explore a career in teaching with an emphasis on ESL and bilingual education while earning both college and high school graduation credits. Through field work and coursework, these students developed and taught lesson plans that incorporate best practices and sheltered instruction to children participating in a summer program at Ellsworth Avenue School. Observed other peers and certified ESL and bilingual teachers, reflected on classroom management and teaching different strategies, and the culminating event is a poster session where students showcase what they've completed uh, through their teaching portfolios. In, uh, in addition to promoting educational opportunities, Soraya has always supported youth felt advocacy groups. Alongside DHS students participating in a community-based advocacy group called uh, CT Students for a Dream, she has also testified at the state capitol in support of undocumented students who are attending college for equal access funds. On April 25th, 2018, uh, Governor Malloy signed that bill into law. Along with her teaching, Soraya is very active in the Danbury High School community. She served as an advisor to the After School Fight Child Hunger Club, the Brazilian Club. She served on the School Governance Council, was a member of the NEAS Steering Committee, and currently serves as the NEA Danbury Union Building Chair for Danbury High School. Prior to teaching, Soraya worked in numerous nonprofits 
organizations such as AmeriCorps and the United States Peace Corps. In the, this volunteer capacity, she served as a community educator in the Kingdom of Tonga in the South Pacific. She taught English at, uh, English at a primary school and high school where she worked with village youth to implement various community-based projects such as village-wide recycling programs, a youth leadership exchange, and a community play. It was, it was her Peace Corps experience that inspired her to pursue a career in teaching. In her spare time, now I know what you're all thinking about that, uh, same thing I was, what spare time? So I enjoy swing dancing, reading fiction, mostly from Stephen King, riding her bike on trails, exploring new places, and spending time with her family and friends. She enjoys uh, writing and has submitted several humor pieces for publication to the Denver High School online newspaper, The Hatter's Herald. Remember the quote from JFK about one person making a difference? I believe you would agree with me that Sarai has done everything in her power to live up to that motto. At this time, I would ask that you unmute your mics and join me giving a tremendous round of applause to our DPS Teacher of the Year, Soraya Bilbao. Soraya, are you going to come on and say something? Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Soraya Bobau. I'm an ESL teacher at Danbury High School. And uh, the tears were already coming down before I muted myself. So um, I, I just, uh, when I was, um, when Kevin and Gran mentioned to me that um, the board and administrators had decided to uh, bestow this uh, recognition to me, I, I was uh, very moved. Um, since uh, joining uh, Danbury High School and working with Danbury Public Schools, um, I have to say it's all been a team effort. Everything that Dan mentioned, uh, I couldn't have done without the support, uh, the encouragement um, of, of fellow colleagues and administrators uh, who believe in, in um, making a difference and making it a positive change in, in young people's lives. Um, I, all of this, I kept thinking back when my first day when I was a, myself a, a senior in high school and I visited Fairfield University for the first time. And I remember going to my uh, tour and immediately feeling this is where I need to be. And um, it was one of the best decisions uh, and I, it was a phenomenal education. That same experience and feeling was what I felt the first day I interviewed uh, at Danbury High School when I went for my interview. I walked into that, that board, that meeting room, I met with everyone, I walked out and I had that exact same feeling. This is where I need to be. This is where I want to work and this is where I can make a difference. Um, so I just want to say thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to work with such dedicated and outstanding individuals. Every single person that I've come in contact with through Danbury High School and Danbury Public Schools um, are, are just as dedicated. So uh, I think there should be a, 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 a whole staff of the year recognition because um, I, I can't, everyone, uh, goes above and beyond um, what they can to support our students. Uh, and especially, I'm honored to have the privilege to teach and learn from some of the most exceptional students uh, that I've encountered. Every single one of them, my ESL students, our ESL students, um, it's the language barrier, but they want to succeed, they want to make a difference, and I'm just happy and proud to be given the opportunity to help them reach their goals. So uh, I, I just want to, again, thank you for this amazing recognition uh, for the kind words and I look forward to many more years working with all of you to continue making a difference and putting Danbury High School, Danbury Public Schools on the map as one of the best places to work. So thank you. I don't know if any board members have a comment. I would just like to say on behalf of the board, thank you. We are blessed to have you in just continue the good work. We are very proud of you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Soraya, congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, really incredible. When I'm listening to Dan, it's just, you know, we've been here a long time, and, and we just sort of expect things, and, and you just always step up and always have youngsters in the front of your thinking, and we're so blessed as 
glad it said uh, to have you with us. So um, really proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on with the agenda, uh, we want to have public participation. Kate. Sure. Uh, due to the unique nature of the COVID-19 crisis and the limitations of technology, members of the public who are Danbury residents are invited to send brief comments and questions via email in advance to dps underscore public comment underscore boe at danbury.k12.ct.us. Um, all comments read out loud will be limited to three minutes. Uh, contributors may offer objective comments of school operations and programs that concern them. The board will not permit any expression of personal complaints or defamatory comments about Board of Education personnel and students or against any person connected with the Danbury Public School System. Sammy? I'm ready. Okay. First comment is from Minnie Santa Santosh. As a middle school student's parent, my son has distance learning and will be there for a while. Did the district take measures to have the privacy safeguards in place for students as they are on the camera through the entire distance learning? Can the district work on a digital background backdrop to blur the background as it is an intrusion of privacy? As an early childhood educator, how is the district expecting a pre-K student with special needs to be on a Chromebook for two and a half hours a day, doing virtual distance learning and assuring that it is a fairly fair delivery of services to the child and also expecting the child care centers to coordinate these services for them if they are at their child care centers while the centers have up to 15 other students in the classroom with minimum staffing. Eric Foreman, it is clear that some administrators and teachers are working very hard during this challenging time. However, there is an overall parent feeling that more needs to be done. Why isn't the Board of Education meeting weekly? We are in the midst of the biggest generational problem our educational system will ever face. And what we receive from our high school pr principal is, guess it's full distance learning for everyone. I know we are trying to position the recent decisions as sound and well thought out, but the reality is we are in the bottom 17% of all state high schools in terms of graduation rate. Not having a plan to immediately address the overcrowded high school is quite frankly insulting. We are spending our time trying to communicate and execute on an overly complex schedule while the kids are suffering. Yes, the kids are suffering and this is reality. We need leadership and it is sorely lacking. Kids rely on teachers, teachers rely on administration, and the Board of Ed is just a report out tool. Now is not the time for parents to hear it's not my decision or we are following state guidelines. We are looking for a leader with courage to step up and lead us out of the hole we have put ourselves in. Confidence is low and our kids are hurting. Melinda Scott. At the last meeting, it was mentioned that there were a few problems with technology. Many teachers are finding that this is not the case. Wi-Fi connectivity for those who have chosen to go into the school buildings has been troublesome at best. As with some of our students, calls are often dropped. We know Google went down a couple times and the fantastically awkward frozen face has happened for all of us. Despite the issues, I wanna point out that we are really making it work. Kids and adults alike have achieved great new levels of IT support. I am deeply concerned about the connectivity when we are all in the buildings though, when students with students and teachers. I know upgrades were mentioned, but based on experience, I remain concerned. To update you on the opening so far, I am so proud of my students for their tenacity and perseverance despite the challenges. I have had better attendance virtually than I normally have in school the first few weeks. I have had several students leave for appointments, the usual dentist, doctor, or flu shot, and rather than be gone for the day like when we were in school, they hop right back on as soon as they get home. Don't get me wrong, I am exhausted. The pace and requirements for the teacher are extreme, but my students are engaged and working. For that, I am very grateful. Lastly, I want to express my feelings on opening and hopefully staying virtual. As I said, for me, the teacher teaching this way is, is exhausting and hours are way too long. It is impossible to get it all done, but being in school in an all distance model allows for much needed consistency right now. Parents have made a plan for all five days and they can be confident in those plans not changing. The kids are also benefiting from this consistency and teachers too. Unlike surrounding districts who have had to shut down because of positive cases, our teachers, students and families can be assured a regular day every day of the week. 
I hope this will be considered when making the decision to return to the hybrid model, as that shift alone is going to only exacerbate the challenges. Michael Milligan. The COVID crisis has caught us all off guard and unprepared. The second half of the spring session was a learning experience for everyone, but it was also a time to become better at meeting the challenges presented by distance learning. As a first grade teacher and an employee of the Board of Ed for over 20 years, as well as a product of DPS, I know I have met and overcome the challenges of working from home and effectively reaching and teaching my students. It is not an ideal situation, but it is working. I am unable to see the validity and the value of the compromise presented to teaching staff of moving from home to a school without students two days a week. Why, what is the reason? The result will be the same. There will be no direct contact with children. They will be home where it is safe. Safety is a major part of the issue. Safety and common sense. How can we be certain that all necessary updates have been completed to assure the proper and safe ventilation exits in each school facility? Has the board purchased and is ready to provide the needed PPE required to assure that each teacher has a sufficient supply to guarantee their personal safety? And why should there be these additional concerns for teachers who are working safely at home? Currently, teachers are given the choice to teach from home or on ca campus. Why must that be modified when teachers who choose to are working from home when they have already brought their supplies and are settled and teaching effectively? Why can't we as adults and professionals make our own choice as to what is best for us and our classes? I understand that should I choose, I can stay home and not work under FMLA. I would be earning full salary for 10 days and then a portion of that for a predetermined period of time and the system would, prove, would provide and pay for the substitute in my place. Again, I ask why. Why would you keep an experienced and dedicated teacher home, not teaching and pay two salaries? I love my job, I want to teach, but I have no interest in exposing myself and through me, my son and my elderly parents to the da dangers of COVID-19. I feel my back is to a wall as I do not see what is being offered as a legitimate compromise, but as a needless and unwise choice. I would welcome justification and an explanation on the position I am being put in so that I can make a truly informed and intelligent vote. Ben Dodo, I want to talk to you about Danbury just doing check-ins on Columbus Day as we won't be in physical school that day. That way we can have no school on May 28th for a PD day. Dana O'Rourke, I have always supported the teachers and staff in Danbury. I feel that they work very hard. I would also like to compliment the administration at DHS for an amazing virtual open house. At the DHS open house this week, flex time was explained and highly suggested for the students to participate in. Has it been considered that if the students were in class time for more than three and a half hours a day, four days a week, that maybe so much flex time might not be needed? If they were in the building, they would not be getting that much flex time. We are also informed by the administration that too much screen time is not good for the kids. They can't play sports or gather, so they get on their phones or video games, more screens. Also, why does school start for DHS almost, almost 30 minutes after it normally will start if they were in the building? If the goal is to eventually get the students back into the building, shouldn't they be starting school at their regular start time so they will be used, used to it when they go back to school? Shouldn't the distance learning model mirror the hybrid model? Uh, parents have been told that this school year is different than any other and we need to be flexible and understanding. We have also been told that the situation changes all the time. Maybe it is time for the DHS schedule to be reviewed to see if it works for all students. We ask that the administration also be flexible and consider that maybe the schedule as it is now does not work for all students. Tina Pody, has the Board of Ed considered allowing teachers or staff members allowance to bring their children into the building to complete their distance learning? Kathy Snow, I would like to commend the administration and teachers on the open house Monday night. They all did a great job considering the circumstances. My request to the superintendent and any other decision maker is to please revisit the time high school students are with their teachers in a synchronous mode. These students are only learning from their teachers three and a half hours a day for four days, four days a week for a total of 14 hours a week. This does not seem like enough time in front of their teachers. This was made very clear at the open house when almost all the teachers I met made some comment about everything taking longer online and running out of time. I understand younger students cannot handle a lot of screen time, but high schoolers can. Screen time high school students can handle versus an elementary student are very different and should be treated as such.
As it is, there is the potential that high school students are done with their day in front of their teachers at 11.30 a.m. if they are not scheduled for any flex time, as the only, man only mandatory flex time is from 8 to 8.25 a.m. on Wednesdays. I am just refreshing the public participation email, and that is it for public participation tonight. Thank you so very much, and we're right on time. We're going to use a half an hour, 7 to 7 30 for public participation, so we can move right into the business part of our meeting. Uh, thank you again, Sandy, so very much. The consent calendar. Um, I'll okay. make a motion that the Board of Education approves the items on the consent calendar, Exhibit 20-95 through Exhibit 20-97 as recommended. Second. Motion made by Kate, seconded by Joe. Any question concerning the consent calendar? <clears throat> Seeing none, all in favor, Kate, call the roll, please. Of course. Uh, Rachel Chileski? Aye. Kate Canetta? Aye. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Lauren Daly? Aye. Uh, Joe De Silva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Aye. Rich Janelli? Aye. Kathy Molinaro? Aye. Al Russo? Aye. Amy Spolina? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Motion so care. Thanks, Kim so very much. Uh, do we have an employee representative here tonight? No? Are any of our students uh, online tonight with us? Yes. Um, I think Jake Goodwin and I from DHS are here. Okay, um, go ahead, young lady. Yeah. Um, um, good to see you and good welcome to you back. Too. Haven't seen you in a while. Um, I just have a couple things to share um, with the start of the school year and just give a little introduction. Um, so my name is Becca DeCilio. You probably have seen me before. I was the um, treasurer for the Board of Governors last year and Jake Goodwin, who's with me tonight, was the secretary. So now I'm the president. He's the vice president for um, the Board of Governors for our senior year. Um, so we're very happy to move into our senior year this year. And I don't think as a freshman we would have expected it to be this way, but um, we are trying to work with our administrators and teachers to make it um, a successful year for the students because that's our job as um, student government. So I'm um, just going to give a couple things that we've done this year and then Jake's going to take over and finish. So we started off the year, I think, pretty great. We had a couple um, internet issues, but that's to be expected with online learning and everything. Um, from what I have heard from the teachers, the attendance has actually been really good from what I hear. Um, it's only about a 1% difference from what it was um, in school. So we have had really good attendance and almost every single one of the classes I've been in has had um, almost every single student there every, every time, which is really good. Um, we've also had, um, you've probably heard some people were crashing our Google Meets, but now um, teachers have more like hosting privileges that they can use. And as we go, um, teachers are going to learn how to use the technology a lot better. So I think it's going really well, um, but hopefully them having more hosting privileges will deter this from happening. And so we won't see it again. So I'm going to leave it to Jake and Jake's going to take over for me. So at the, as distance learning started, all DHS students were given a free Dell laptop to keep which we are very grateful for. And so many more kids now have access to technology at home, which is great. We are looking for ways to connect with students over the internet. It's proving pretty difficult. Um, we are planning a spirit week, something related to that for some time in October, which will most likely be held virtually. We did something similar last year. <clears throat> so we're also getting the club fair in works for some time in October. We're hoping that this will get more kids engaged with the school, especially freshmen. We're really trying to um, pull engagement. So, and lastly, the BOG and peer leaders are working with an organization offering scholarship opportunities to students who register to vote. Very cool. There will also be an opportunity to have parents and families register as well. In a school with the most registrations by election day will receive a $10,000 grant. And that's all I have for you guys. Thank you. Thank you both so very much. 
Mattis, would you mind if I ask a question? Thank you. Jake or Rebecca, we're, we're hearing, you know, from a lot, a lot of folks in terms of um, time in front of screen and um, the technology challenges. Just from your perspective and with your, with, your, with your friends and how is it going in terms of time uh, and, and the activities that you're doing, you're finding this year? Can you give us a little thumbnail? For, um, as yeah. You see it? I think Jake and I, Jake and I were actually just having a conversation about this and we, we as students, I know for myself, it's really hard for me to sit in front of like a screen for a really long period of time. And I know if I was on the screen from 7.30 to 2, which is what a normal school day would be, I would be exhausted by the end of it. There's no way I could hold focus for that long. Um, So that I think the times for the classes are actually like, perfect i know teachers are feeling slightly rushed i'm in i'm in a lot of ap classes so there is a time crunch a little bit um with ap classes because we have to take those tests in may but the teachers are like utilizing the flex time that we're given and either offering instruction during that time um or they're just either reiterating what we were already taught to students who may have been absent during that time um but i personally like the time jake can speak on it too if you if you want I also like the time, um, although it does um, feel like we're not doing as much as if we were in building, but I also feel like we're still working out, um, or teachers are still working out like the kinks and stuff. So I agree. I think um, I think it's a good time, a good a, a good amount of time. And the technology has been okay. I'm just. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank yeah, you very much, guys. Been, of course. It's been iffy, like at times, but that's to be expected with Thank technology. You. I have a question for I a student. Have a question for the students. Um, how is your how is your homework load or your um you know your independent workload? How does that compare to in person? Do you feel like it's more or less same? Jake, do you want to go? I feel like it's um, I'm like like Becca. I'm I'm also taking mostly APs, so it seems like a bit more work. But I'm pretty sure that's just um, like in my honors class. I'm not really getting much homework. Um, I just think the teachers are being very smart with like how much um, like how much they're giving the kids, like how much they think that kids can do with re- respect to this situation that we're in. Yeah. Right now, I, I think they're doing like a good job. Like, I wouldn't say my workload is is too much. Okay, I I personally think I have more than than last year, but I think that's also because we have less time to do classwork in mm-hmm. class. So we're, yeah, we're they're too. doing that, but we also have more time after school to do to do work. Like, I would have gotten out at you know two, and and now I have two hours less. So now I have two hours more time to do work than normal. So I think it balances out. Yeah. So you feel like you have a good balance there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Are there any other questions that board members would like? Any other board members would like to ask our two students a question? Seeing none. Uh, Dr. Sarah, you finished? Thank you, guys. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. Of course. So, um, <clears throat> as you know, as we talked about going into this the uh, pandemic and the uh, research that we've had with the medical field that we'll be reviewing that um, particularly this week. We have a uh, meeting on Friday with all of the uh, medical folks. Um, We felt the timing would be right given uh, Labor Day and uh, the possible surge in the numbers. Uh, If any of you read the paper today, as I did with the federal report on the states, they were highlighting Connecticut and they explicitly talked about Danbury's impact on the state in terms of the numbers. Um, you know, I, I will tell you um, personally, uh, in talking to parents, that there, there, there's, there's quite a um, number of folks who would like to see youngsters back. Uh, but we have been tracking uh, the medical um, doctrine. We've been looking at that daily, if not weekly. Um, and so I thought tonight would be good to have an initial kind of review talk about some of the things we'll be looking at on Friday uh, as we start looking at our goal, which was 
the very turning here towards the, you know, middle to the end of October here. So um, I have with us tonight, uh, Kara and Kathy. Uh, I will have Kathy begin. Um, Kathy O'Dowd, who has been just tremendous at helping, not just us, but by the way, guys, she's been working with the non-pubs as well. Uh, and that has been, because those youngsters have been in school or out of school. And she's really uh, burning the uh, candle on both ends. Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Sal. Um, so before we talk about moving forward, I would like to just offer a brief review of where we've been and how we got to the decision to do the distance learning as a return to school and um, the information and the guidance that we're using to move forward. So if you recall, um, in July, the governor had um, stated that all districts should be back in the fall, full time in person uh, learning for school. Um, and there is a, a metrics that the state of Connecticut uses. It's three tiers that um, outlines what is a low risk for returning, what is moderate risk in terms of needing the hybrid model, and then what is high risk in terms of recommending distance learning. And the way that's calculated is uh, we look at what we call the seven day rolling average of positive cases. Now, when the state puts out that metrics, um, they are doing it on a countywide level. Um, however, we have had to look at just Danbury alone um, because of the uptick that we've had and our space con uh, constraints. So in July, um, according to that metrics, uh, the district would have been considered at low risk for transmission, and therefore we could have returned under that metrics to a full-time model. However, with our building uh, constraints and the overcrowded conditions that we have, we did not feel that we could safely have everyone in the building at all times five days a week. And that is when Dr. Sal um, appealed to the state, to the governor, to have us move to a hybrid model. And that was our plan at the time. Then in early August, um, we started to see an uptick in the number of positive cases in Danbury. And um, that has continued. And by mid-August, we had to make a decision. And based on that, what we call that seven-day rolling average. So what the health department does is they look at cases, the number over seven days, and that is averaged and then based on a population of 100,000 and we get, <clears throat> excuse me, a percentage, um, average cases a day. Um, and Kara will speak to those, you know, specific numbers, but um, at that time we felt that it would not be safe for us to return to a hybrid model and that's why we chose to go with distance learning. And that recommendation was given to Dr. Sal by the medical team which is myself, Kara Prunty, uh, Dr. Fong, who's the district's medical advisor, and Dr. Begg, who is the medical advisor for the city health department. So that's what moved us toward the decision to go with distance learning. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, we still have an excellent partnership with the Department of Health. Kara has been very accessible to us and she's participated in all of our district meetings and she's been a very valued resource. So we, we speak probably daily, sometimes more, um, and we, we meet as needed and we're continuing to review those numbers. So what we're seeing in the community right now um, is still what we consider to be a concerning transmission rate of COVID. Um, and right now, uh, what we're seeing is a result of the Labor Day weekend. Um, you know, we're two weeks out, and with that incubation period of COVID being two to 14 days, um, it's being with through contact tracing. We're seeing that there were large gatherings. Um, people are not wearing masks. They're not social distancing. So we're still seeing some numbers of positive cases that are very concerning to us. Um, in addition to the fact that. Um, many of them are children. Um, while we see some positives at the elementary level, we're seeing um, a more significant number um, at the secondary level. Um, so for that reason, um, 
you know, at this time, we're, we're still very concerned about being able to open with a hybrid model. Um, however, we'll continue to look at the data. As Dr. Sal had mentioned, we are meeting on Friday. Kathy, we lost your voice, if you could hear me. Can't hear you. Oh, yeah. hold on. Kathy, yeah, we you lost. lost me? Okay, hold on. We got you back. <laughs> you got me back. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know where I left off, so I'll just go back. Um, you know, we are prepared to open as far as a safe plan. Um, the district is, you know, we've talked about many times. This has been an amazing team. Um, it's been uh, a great effort in putting together, you know, the mitigation strategies. Uh, the ventilation's been addressed. Um, you know, we have all of the schools now have, you know, markers and arrows on the floor for safe distancing. Uh, we have all the PPE that we need. Um, we were very fortunate to find a vendor that um, enabled us to get everything that we needed in a very short period of time. So we are prepared on that level as well. We lost your voice again. We lost your voice, Kathy. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I guess I'm having some connection issues here. Um, as I said, our issue now is the community transmission. So, uh, you know, I, I strongly encourage everyone to continue to wear your masks, frequent hand washing. Please avoid large gatherings where you can't wear a mask and safely distance because that's where, you know, we're finding the, the increased cases that we're seeing. Um, and in terms of returning, you know, we have um, a very detailed plan in place as to how we will address whether we have a possible case of COVID, whether we have a confirmed case of COVID, um, we have looked very closely at how we can manage it on the elementary and secondary levels. It will be a little different just because of the scheduling um, and the ability to cohort at the elementary level will make things easier. Um, but, um, you know, as I said, we're prepared. It, it's just a matter of the community numbers trending down and we're not seeing that yet. Kara. Hi everyone. And I just, I just want to say thank you to Kathy. I know how hard she's been working. So I just want to let everyone know that she has been doing such a fantastic job and I really appreciate all of the work that she does and the work that she does with me. So thank you, Kathy, for that. Um, and she covered a lot of it. I just want to uh, piggyback off that and mention some specifics of what's going on right now. Um, so right now, as she referenced, our seven-day rolling average per 100,000 is uh, 14, a little over 14, uh, which would, you know, on the scale, put us in the moderate level. Um, our numbers have stabilized since August 21st. Um, We've trended down a little bit, but we have not seen a consistent trend down. Uh, we're still seeing uh, positivity rates between five and 6% um, consistently every week. So that's uh, a concerning level for us. Um, we're seeing community transmission, um, as Kathy mentioned, through our contact tracing. We're still seeing um, a lot of spread through uh, small parties, uh, family gatherings, things like that. Um, so we just, we really, uh, want to stress and and say that this is still out there we're really doing our best to to do targeted testing and messaging and but you know i think that people have been hearing this message over and over again it's kind of background noise at this point so i just want to urge you all to take it very seriously so that way we can get this our numbers down and have uh, the ability to open safely so that's that's all i have um, I, the board had asked for, uh, you know, s some information, and I, I think, Kara, what I'm asked at the time is when you disaggregate the numbers, you do take out certain categories, correct, and and then look at it through a different lens, so it's focusing in on, um, you know, our, our town folks. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so I, I separated out for Danbury residents. So when I'm looking and I'm discussing positivity rates and seven day rolling averages, I'm talking about Danbury residents, people with Danbury addresses. So the pre-op and the nursing and all of that is removed? Some of that is if they are Danbury residents, it is included. It's hard to hear. Oh, sorry. If they're Danbury residents, some of that is included. Um, when we do more targeted testing through groups um, in areas where we know that there's a lot of community spread, we are seeing higher positivity rates. So when you incorporate the pre-op testing, uh, the, just the routine testing, that's when we still get that between five and six positivity rate. So I don't know, maybe the board may have some questions. I will just we'll stop right now. <clears throat> So, okay, so the positivity rate is the people that you that have actually been tested and and the hospitalizations have gone down. Actual people who are admitted to the hospital. So these people are not showing symptoms. They, they are asymptomatic. I can't hear you. There's a combination of symptomatic and uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. So there, there's both. We're seeing both people. Um, we're just not seeing that translate into hospitalizations at this time. Okay. And what percentage are do we need to be in order for the children to attend school? Where do you want that percentage rate to be? So it's a combination of all. I can't hear you. Sorry. There's a it's. There's a combination of all of the metrics. It's not just the positivity rate. It's that combined but with that's the, seven. the one that that's the one that you're focused in on right now. Five seven, to six. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a combination of all of them. So it's the seven day rolling average. It's the positivity rate, and it's also whether our numbers are trending in the right direction. So um, it's it's all of those things working together. Kara, I have a question if Kathy's done. Yes, um, thank you, Joe. Yep. Kara, hospitalizations are down because I was looking at the state numbers and they look like they're up. In fact, the, the daily report today showed I think it was like three more hospitalizations. We're back up to like 70. Are our local hospitalizations down? Uh, at this point, yes. Good. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to check. That's that's really good news, obviously. The rest of it's bad, but that's good. Thank you. <laughs> So, so Kathy, one of the things that we're, I think it was, you know, we're learning a lot going through this and the conversations we're having uh, are these indicators. And, and one of the things that uh, for us anyway, uh, you know, we're challenged with the, the spacing, the social you know, distancing. The crowding issue. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yes. And in the moderate level on, the, I think I had said to Kara the same question, where, where on this, on this scale, and if uh, I think one of the things we were looking at it, if we're attending on the bottom of this moderate level, which is this, the 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 second the second category the state looks like, that's something that would indicate to us that um, although it's not as good as it may have been, you know, in August, it might be appropriate for us to do um, uh, look at um, the, the, the in in school learning, and I think that's on Friday we're going to try to disaggregate through all of that. Um, I will just set a seat out there for the entire board because I, we've been reading and I've been asking and talking and, you know, there, there's some merit to phasing things in as possibilities. There's also conversations from things that I've been reading from our, our parents and others that are early students, K1 and 2 and 3, um, very difficult for them to sustain the time. So looking at that in a differentiated fashion, I don't think you can have... Uh, one size fits all here is what I'm saying to everybody. And um, we're diligent in looking at this to find the opportunity um, to bring youngsters back. On Friday, that's our goal to look at what makes it. Uh, but I thought they should give you at least a thumbnail sketch of what they're seeing as the professionals. And we'll have um, the medical doctors in with us on Friday. And um, have some better numbers because they do collect them every day to, to make some decision. Because as you know, we were, our goal was, um, you know, the mid October, just towards the third week or so of October to return. Um, when we're going to be talking about 
the, the real reality of doing something for that on product. And um, that's where we're at. Um, Gladys, that's okay. all I can, as a board member, uh, have a question of the, of the medical folks. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you both. Uh, we're moving on down the agenda. Uh, action item A. Uh, I'll start with action item A. I'll make a motion that the board oh, mentioned. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm okay. Can you hear us? I can. Okay. I I'm going to move. Okay. okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank yes. you. Uh, I'll make a motion that the Board of Education approve the June 2020 operating results and analysis in accordance with Exhibit 20-99. Second. I'm not sure if Gladys might be frozen, it looks like, so I'll just ask if motion there are any made. questions. Can I hear okay. second? Second. Second. Okay, motion made by uh, Kate, seconded by uh, are there, uh, Courtney, do you have anything to add to this uh, motion? Oh, uh, no, thank you, though, Gladys. This is just the year end result. Courtney, it's hard to hear you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you have any comments to add to this? Oh, no, Gladys, thank you. It's just the year end results from the last fiscal year showing what funds we can carry over into our reserves as we had discussed at the last board meeting. So thank okay. you. Okay. Um, okay. Any is no question, any questions from board members? Seeing none, uh, Kate, would you do the roll call, please? Certainly. I'll start with uh, Rachel Shalesky, please. Aye. Kate Canetta, aye. Gladys Cooper. Aye. Lauren Daly. Aye. Joe DeSilva. Aye. Catherine Hodgson. Aye. Rich Janelli. Aye. Kathy Molinero. Aye. Al Russo. Aye. Amy Spolino. Aye. Motion approved unanimously. Okay. Motion so care. Thank you all very much. Action item B. Rachel? Yes. I move that the Board of Education accept for a second reading and adoption policy 2150 visits to the schools as accepted by the policy committee, uh, uh, exhibit 20 100. I'll second that. Motion made by Rachel to second by Kate. Are there any questions concerning motion? Seeing none, Kate, do the roll call. Rachel Tulesky? Aye. Kate Canetta, aye. Gladys Cooper, aye. Lauren Daly, aye. Joe De Silva, aye. Catherine Hodgson, aye. Rich Janelli, aye. Catherine, sorry, Kathy Molinero, aye. Al Russo, aye. Amy Spolino, aye. Okay. Ten eyes. Motion to us. Motion so care. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, but I so I didn't want to uh, admit um, I was sitting with the superintendent uh, on this motion. If he would like to add something, just stop me. I'm seeing him be going a little fast, so you guys can stop me at any time. Uh, action item C, Al Russo. Action item C, policy 5141.8, face mask and coverings. I'll make a motion that we accept. Board of Education except for the second reading and adoption policy 5141.8 face mask coverings as accepted by the policy committee. And a question made by Al Sackman by Amy. Are there any questions concerning the motion? Yes, I just have um, one small thing. Um, I thought we had just in the first paragraph um, that we would omit the last two words full time 
Um, again, the first paragraph, last sentence, last two words, remove um, full time. I would like this to be brought for a third reading if, if possible. Uh, where's um, I, I, I saw including YouTube ad drivers to keep working. Um, is Mr. Watson? Um, Hi, Ms. Cooper. Yes, I, I am here. I'm sorry. Can can we hear that adjustment again? I, I didn't hear that. I'm not. I didn't hear. Shall I read the first paragraph, Rachel? The first paragraph. Um, it's. Uh, this policy pertains to students, faculty, staff, and visitors. It has been developed to fulfill the guiding principles contained in the framework for Connecticut schools, specifically to safeguard the health and safety of students and staff, and to allow all students the opportunity to return into classrooms, period. I'd like um, full time to be omitted. Does that make sense? Yes, I mean, I mean, is that is that the adjustment that is that the only adjustment that needs to be made that we're seeing? Yes. Okay. Can can we approve with and with the understanding that we will make that adjustment? If I think so. I think so. Yeah, I, I think it makes it, it it it's applicable in every case. Not so. I think it's it clar right. clarifies it. Yeah, I don't want it to be taken out of context. Right. It doesn't change it. So. Mm -hmm. I would I would agree. Point of so order, Madam can... Chair, do we need a do we need an amendment for that or can we just do that based on the understanding we're doing it? I think we can make an understanding that uh, Mr. Watson uh, uh, make the Madam Chair. I would say it's more a clarifying change than anything. It's not changing the context, just a clarification amendment. So I would just make it now. Okay. So we can go ahead and, and approve it tonight without bringing it to a third reading. Okay. Is that, am I understand right, Rachel? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, is there uh, a motion? Okay. Kate, did you do roll call? I don't forget. Sure, I'll do that now. Okay, uh, Rachel Chalesky? Aye. Kate Canetta? Aye. Kate. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Lauren Daly? Aye. Joe De Silva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Janelli? Aye. Kathy Molinero? Aye. Al Russo? Aye. Amy Spolina. Aye. That's 10 motion Thank you, motion motion. Uh, action item D, Rachel. I move that the Board of Education accept reading as amended and adoption emergency suspension of policy during as accepted by the policy committee, exhibit 20-102. Second. Motion made by Rachel, second by Joe. Are there any questions concerning the motion? Any corrections that need to be made? Seeing none, uh, uh, Kate, can we have a roll call, please? Rachel Chalesky? Aye. Kate Canetta? Aye. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Lauren Daly? Aye. Joe De Silva? Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Janelli. Aye. Kathy Molinero. Aye. Al Russo. Aye. Amy Spolina. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, the motion still carries. We're gonna move on to uh, policy E. I'll make a motion that the Board of Education accept for the second reading and adoption policy 6114.82, COVID emergency measures as accepted by the policy committee in Exhibit 20-103. Second. Policy made by Kate, second by Joe. Any corrections and a question concerning this policy? Thank you all for taking the opportunity uh, at our last meeting. We put them on uh, the 
cards up for this reading and hope everyone had opportunity to go through them. So, uh, seeing now, Kate, will you uh, do the roll call? Of course. Rachel Chalesky? Aye. Key Canetta? Aye. Gladys Cooper? Aye. Lauren Daly? Aye. Joe Silva, Aye. Catherine Hodgson? Aye. Rich Janelli? Aye. Kathy Molinero? Aye. Al Russo? Aye. Amy Spolino? Aye. Motion carries in one Motion so carried. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lawson and the uh, chairperson. Uh, policy okay. committee. Uh, um, may I, may I before, before we continue, Gladys, may I ha just make a comment? There's yes. a lot of no there's a lot of extra noise tonight. I don't know if someone has a phone and a computer on, but it's like there's just a lot of feedback. Or maybe it's me. Maybe I should sound back on. No, I'm hearing it as well. No I've been no, it's not just you, Amy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ah. <laughs> I thought the TV was on in the living room. I kept hearing this noise, and I know my TV was not on in the living room, so I don't know where it's coming from. Okay. Is that better? Was that out of the Yeah, we're ready? Okay. Yes. Let's start with AIS. Um, and um, Courtney, do you want to bring it up? Superintendent report. Sure. Courtney, I'll start if you'd like. Oh, right. thanks, Kevin. Okay. Okay. So, so Dr. South Courtney and I are both going to speak. Uh, so, so one, I, I just wanted to update the board on our AIS magnet school enrollment. Um, the difference between October 1st, 2019 and to date where we are with enrollment. Um, and then Courtney is going to help, help me and help us um, clarify um, so that we can understand the impact um, that has on us financially. So, so last year we had, as of October 1st, we had 504 students um, at AI um, in our, from our, I'm sorry, we had 99 students from our partner towns at AIS and 34 students uh, from our non-partner non -partner student um, uh, schools. And for a total of 133 kids last year. And, and this year uh, we are down in our partner towns, partner school districts from 99 to 81, and our non-partner districts from 34 to 33. So for a total or a difference of negative 19. So we are down 19 students from the 2019 school year to 2020, 2021. Um, and so um, uh, Dr. Sal is, is working with the other superintendents to make sure those partner districts um, still honor their commitment to pay for those students. Um, although, you know, those, those families have chosen to remain back at their home schools. Um, as you might imagine, um, our neighboring towns or our partner towns um, are still in school. Um, you know, we are only the only school in the area that is in the hybrid, I'm sorry, in virtual learning, distance learning. And so a lot of those families have chosen to keep their kids in their home school district and have not and have chosen not to send them to AIS this year. And so certainly, you know, uh, Dr. Sal, as you might imagine, was concerned about the financial impact and had uh, Courtney, you know, Courtney and I both investigate um, and, and investigate where we are. And so I provided some data enrollment updates to Courtney and then she began to further investigate what this meant locally, you know, between us and the towns and then uh, look further into how we might be, be able to get some relief from the state. Uh, Courtney. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so as Kevin mentioned, that, that decline related to the virus results in a loss of revenue to the district from the state because we get reimbursed. Courtney, it's very difficult to hear you. I'm sorry. Um, hmm. Is that better? Can you hear me better now? I can hear you, Courtney. A little okay. bit. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'll talk loudly. Um, so basically the state reimburses us about $7,700 per pupil. So we, uh, with that um, loss in enrollment, we would lose about $86,000 from the state. So Dr. Sal did ask that we, um, we draft a letter that he sent to our legislators asking us to keep us whole 
um, and continue with what we had for fiscal year 1920s appropriation so that we don't lose that funding. And he's also, as Kevin mentioned, working with the partner districts because there's a small portion that they contribute um, on behalf of their students for tuition and we're asking them to continue to maintain that commitment. So he wanted me to make you aware of that. Um, that, that uh, I think at this point, um, without the tuition, we're about I mean, roughly just under $90,000 Delta, correct? That's correct. Yep. About 86,000. Yeah. That's right. So I just want to make the board aware. I was concerned it was be be much greater, um, but that's where we are right now. And we can't just admit our students. We still have to stay with our split, which um, you know, in 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 seventy thirty, we're usually you know sixty forty. But so we just we can only admit X amount of students that are non contributing students. And but everything is done as of October 1. So this is just rough numbers, unofficial until October 1. But I did want to make you aware of that. So thank you. Um, district enrollment with um, district learning attendance and connectivity. We have. That is. Yep. I, Go yep. Ahead. I, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm here, Dr. Sal. Um, so I'll share the district and district enrollment um, right now overall we have 11,907 students um, enrolled and and um, as compared to October 1st of last year we were at 11,927 so that's a difference of 20 minus 20 kids um, the big biggest uh, Factor that I see is the kindergarten enrollment. Um, typically, we shoot for about 920 is the number that we look for um, as enrollment uh, ramps up in October. Right now, we're at 829, so that's a significant um, significant drop. Uh, but overall, we believe that's you know people are maybe holding their kids back um, this year uh, and you know, gonna send their kids next year to kindergarten. Um, that's the biggest uh, jump that I see. And, um, but we have a hundred more middle schoolers than we did last year at this time. Um, so that's the, that's where we are with enrollment down, down a little bit from where we normally would be. And again, official numbers will be on October 1st. So we still have another week of some movement happening. Um, and this, these numbers include all of our kids that are currently enrolling. So they were as of two o'clock this afternoon. So they also include anybody who um, just filled out an enrollment today. So we haven't as seen, far as the board has been concerned about the influx. We have not seen that. Mon, I just- We to... have not seen that. Um, Again, we're just watching, uh, you know, on the national level when borders start to open and more travel starts to happen, uh, you know, we anticipate that we'll see a little bit of a surge there um, as well. So um, with the distance learning, I um, have been meeting with the state uh, with their Everybody Learns initiative. Um, at the end of the week, they are supposed to be sending the vouchers for Comcast. Um, the program is such that uh, we will provide a voucher number to families who are in need of internet. Comcast will provide high-speed internet to them for one year with the voucher. Um, and uh, I anticipate that next week we will be uh, able to start rolling that out. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Anne and I are gonna work together to um, have a kind of help desk at the um, face center so that we can help families navigate um, and any problems that they have with connectivity. Uh, the state has been more than willing. They said if any family really runs into an issue, um, maybe you know they don't quite qualify under Comcast rules, um, things like that, just to reach out to them. They're, they're really pushing for you know, everybody to have uh, strong connectivity and they said they would, you know, work with us um, to help those families as well. So that should be coming next week. 
Um, and I'm really excited about that. On attendance. Uh, uh, yep. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to report we're very positive um, trends with our attendance as reported by the students and, and the teachers that you heard anecdotally from. Um, our attendance is exactly in line with where it was last year. In fact, it was up 0.2% uh, uh, from this time last year. Um, one of the things that I spoke about uh, last uh, board meeting was the increased reporting that we're doing for the state in tracking disconnected students, as they're calling it. Um, so each week, it's public data. Um, we are collecting um, the number of students in each instructional model which for us is obviously all fully remote at all grade levels and including a, a reporting number for um, a, including a reporting number for uh, students who are disconnected that are fully remote. Last year they had um, last year they had across the state a trend that was um, finding that students who were fully remote and just kind of fell off from the district and did not report in at all. So um, they are trying to prevent that from happening. So each school is actually tracking students who are not reporting in. So have uh, a, a week that is completely absent. The administrators, school counselors, teachers are all following up with those families. Um, to ensure that everybody knows where they are. So our, re our report from last week of disconnected students was 121. Um, that's across all school buildings. So that's about 1%. Um, and so, you know, considering our population, um, it is also um, being so large, 121 is not an incredibly high number. Um, in addition, <clears throat> um, the, the, the amount of um, effort that's being um, done by the school level to follow up with these families is absolutely tremendous. It is also not unlike other school years where students have dropped or moved um, out of the district and we are, we are looking for them. So um, we can't drop students until we have confirmation of their enrollment in a new district. So um, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, across the schools, is there a big um, uh, difference or is it pretty even across all schools? Is, there, is it concentrated in one or? You know, obviously the high school is our, our largest school that, that has the highest numbers. Right. Um, but, but I would say it's comparable across the middle schools. Um, they're all about the same. And most elementary schools, the pocket here and there may be the highest with eight kids, but sometimes that can be just with kids moving in high rental areas. Um, and, and we just haven't touched base yet. So I would say it's pretty well dispersed and the similar trend across the district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kara. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. We've got, we're gonna talk a little bit about, let me just start with uh, C. Osborne Ellsworth. I will say the summit, uh, that's still in negotiations um, and um, we should be hearing more and um, hopefully pretty soon on that. So um, right now I don't have much to report except that they're still in some negotiations about uh, language and things that may be in a bill. So um, still very helpful. Um, Osborne Ellsworth, um, we've got um, Ellsworth uh, and Osborne uh, project. Uh, do you have anything on that to update the board, Courtney? Yeah, um, we're on track. Um, there were, I think, seven um, architects invited, and I think um, four did the walkthrough, and they've selected an architect. So we're, we're on track in the design phase um, and still, you know, on schedule to be opening when we anticipated, which would be next year. So, um, you know, I'm look for, looking forward to having another update at the next board meeting. Um, but we're on schedule as of this point. Uh, if there's no question, if there's no question, I'll move to uh, Kelly Granville. 
Yeah, so um, Granville is coming along. Um, my last conversation with the builder, they hope to um, complete the project within the around the first week of October. Um, and then it will be um, the final approvals and um, building permits from the city. So um, our timeline is hopefully matching up with the return for um, uh, students to come into the building. Um, and as soon as we um, are able to do a walkthrough, uh, we will certainly reach out to you and let you know. But overall, um, things are progressing along. Um, it is taking a little bit longer than anticipated. There have definitely been some hurdles that the builder has run into. Um, things like getting the windows um, in supply. The factory we had originally ordered from was shut down due to COVID. Um, then there was a delay with something else. And I think we're on our third order, but uh, things are installed, they're moving along. And it's really a lot of the finishing touches at this point in time. Um, and just a big thank you to, um, you know, Rich Jalbert, Rich Torres. They have been um, instrumental in kind of advising on different um, safety features, security features. Um, our tech team, uh, Gina and Lack, have been wonderful in making sure that all of our bandwidth and all of that has been set up. So it's truly a, a team effort. Um, and Courtney and Kim, uh, you know, all of their, uh, whether it's food services or the legal nature of things, it, it truly is a, a team effort. So I just thank this board. I'm really excited about the opportunity to have officially an early childhood center. And I think it'll be wonderful for our kids. Yeah, I'm not sure with COVID, but at some point we could probably take a tour of the board members in small groups. Um, I think you even maybe do a video or a picture. Yeah, as a, I think as we're pretty close to what they're doing. But, um, so, so thank you, Kelly, very much. Um, I, I, we weren't at the PTO meeting because we had negotiations that night, but I know a few board members were there. But um, Kevin, would you want to update the rest of the board on that? Sure, sure. Um, so on Friday, uh, September 11, 11, Dr. Mead and I met with uh, the new citywide PTO president, uh, Tim Maroney, and his team. Uh, at that time, he had shared um, just under 40 uh, Q&As, uh, questions and answers that uh, parents were seeking and wanted clarification on. Um, I had, uh, we had taken those questions, put them in a Google Doc. The cabinet and I and other members um, of the district began to answer them. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll share them. I believe uh, Dr. Mee has a place on the website uh, where, we, where they have been posted already or we will post them. Um, but, but, but some of the highlights from that, even in terms of the questions, um, you'll, you'll, you'll note this evening that you may have heard uh, some feedback about some of those questions this evening because we incorporated them immediately and began to try to find ways to make sure uh, we were answering those questions. And, and in many ways, I, I feel like uh, the feedback from these in-person citywide PTO meetings are really a reflection of the questions that all of our parents have. Um, and so some of the questions that resonated from the evening, can we have our kids engage in more online learning? Uh, some families were saying that there wasn't enough time attributed to online learning. Um, I, I, it's also important for me to pause and just say the families and the PTO members and representatives applauded the opening of uh, online learning in our first couple of weeks of school. Um, and talked about you know how 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 well um, the launch of it was during the first couple of weeks, um, which, which was certainly um, you know well received when I brought that information back to the team, and hopefully all of our teachers are hearing this as well, and our principals are hearing this as well. Um, uh, there was also a, a question that request: Can the district take a closer look to make sure we are fully engaging all students on Wednesdays? Um, and so that's something we've also taken into consideration and we'll begin to, um, you know, as we continue to get better at our delivery, we'll be looking at all of these things. Um, and then there were questions um, that evening about how is the decision made to return to schools? Um, and so you heard some feedback this evening officially from uh, Cara Prunty and uh, Kathy O'Dowd, along with Dr. Sal. Um, and then there was also a question, is it true that we will require a vaccine before we return to in-person learning. And, and frankly, um, that question carried over to Monday. Um, as Dr. Sal mentioned, um, we were in a, 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 um, negotiations that evening, so all of us were not able to attend. Uh, but this question in particular required some clarification. And I would imagine if it required clarification from the people in attendance, it probably required clarification from people in the community. Uh, so we made sure we included uh, some clarification in Dr. Sal's letter that went out on Friday, uh, but I think it's also important to just further clarify here this evening. Um, and so, and so it, it was apparent that evening, quite frankly, that 
there was a need to address any misconceptions that may have existed. Um, and just so I just want to provide some now. So over the summer, due to our school space issues, the district appealed to the state to have in-person learning in the hybrid model at a maximum of 50% capacity. Um, and then, and so our hope and plan is, not our hope, but our plan is when we return to in-person learning, it will be in a hybrid model. And until the Board of Ed is advised by the district medical advisors and the state and local health officials that it is safe to return to full in-person learning, we will remain, when we do go back to school in hybrid, I'm sorry, when we do back, go back to school in in-person learning, it will be in hybrid until local health officials, et cetera, tell us that it's safe for 100% capacity and all kids can return back to school. So I just wanted to provide that clarification for the community. I hope that's clear um, because there, there was some confusion that evening. There were several questions in the Q&A document. Um, it, I, I guess, I, I don't know if I mentioned it or Dr. Sal had mentioned in the previous board meeting that we would need a vaccine before we can fully return to school. Um, and and it, it's not that clear cut. And so, uh, you know, the, again, the plan is when we can, when the numbers are reduced, in the town and, and the local health officials, Carol Prunty, who I believe is still on this call, say it is safe to return back in hybrid, we will do so. And we will remain in that model um, and, and, and go back to 100% in-person learning when the health advisors tell us that it's safe to do so again. So, um, you know, th that evening uh, was a great evening, quite frankly. Um, it, was, it was great, number one, to see parents and see folks in person again. Uh, we sat socially distanced at the POW, at the POW building in the parking lot here in Danbury. Um, there was probably 20 to 25 uh, uh, citywide, I'm sorry, uh, PTO representatives from the, from the city. And, and again, many of the questions that we heard uh, from our parents this evening um, mirrored what we heard that evening um, on that Monday night. Uh, so, you know, look forward to seeing them again next month. Uh, but that's kind of an overview of um, the, four, the, the meeting on the 14th. And as you can see, you know, many of the responses and presentations for this evening was in direct response to what we heard that evening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the next area has been uh, Yeoman task for him and her department to come through uh, accommodations. And um, Kim, do you want to review that with the board? Right. So um, as we sort of start to think about a return to a hybrid model where um, there will be students in the buildings, one of the things that um, one of the, the, the valleys we've had to cross is what happens to those of our employees who have serious health conditions that preclude them from being able to report to in-person um, teaching or work of some kind. Um, we had requests for accommodation from over 125 people. And the way the process works is for um, them to provide medical support of a serious health condition to my office. And then each one of those 125 people has had at least one, sometimes more than one um, in-person meet, live meeting with either myself or with Jen Gonzalez to talk about um, the scope and nature of the condition and to start to explore what kinds of accommodations we could provide as the employer that would enable these people to return to, to full duty. Uh, so those conversations have been ongoing. In some cases, we've sought additional medical information. In some cases, it's just been a dialogue back and forth. And the accommodations, to give you some idea, range anywhere from um, additional PPE or plexiglass or a room assignment to complete work from home model. Um, so each one of these requires kind of individual conversation, individual attention, and, and the goal is to find um, the sweet spot of the accommodation that we can provide without an undue hardship. So we're rounding the bend. We've got kind of a, a handful of them left, um, mostly specials teachers, um, but also a handful of others that we're just making our way through the last ones now. Um, so what that means then is with that list, armed with the, that information, um, then I transition to what is this going to look like if we have um, staff who need to work from home? And so as a team, we've been working with um, elementary um, organizers, planners, um, principals. We've been working with middle school principals as a group, and we've been working with the high school. Um, what a modified model for that for those staff members could look like. Um, in addition, I've had to spend a lot of time working with Rich Jalbert and his team on what kinds of accommodations we can put in terms of physical changes, um, physical space, um, 
provision of supplies. That also involved talking with Kathy O'Dowd at length um, on each of these individual cases. So I'm happy to say we're coming to the end. Um, I will say from my perspective, it has been wonderful to meet individually with so many of these people. It's really given me a good idea of um, what people are struggling with, what's going well, what's not going well. Um, I will tell you that uniformly, all of them start with a big smile. And when I say, how's it going? They all say, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Um, it's just from our most junior folks to our most veteran people across all bargaining units. I think people have really dug in to make this um, successful, to sort of learn and make changes from the spring. Um, and so that's been a really good window for, for me and for my team to see kind of how people are, are handling all this out in the field. Um, so that's been great. What's on the horizon for us? Um, I believe I've mentioned for you before um, two real pressure points we're going to have. One is that if you read the newspaper at all, you see that surrounding districts are having trouble attracting, retaining, and keeping substitutes. Um, we are not going to be alone in that. We are trying right now to kind of keep our toe in the water with them, but because we aren't really using any of them, they're kind of slipping away. So we're trying to kind of keep them engaged. Um, we're trying to put together some training, particularly on the um, technology that we're using so that they will have something um, in their, some arrows in their quiver when they come on board finally. Um, so that's one big concern. And, and we're gonna continue to kind of look at options for what substituting might look like for us. Um, the other big um, challenge that I think we may face is we've seen some folks request um, the intermittent leave for child care purposes under the Families First Coronavirus Act. Um, that means in kind of easy terms, um, if I have children in my district, in my house that are distance learning Monday and Tuesday, um, and they are young children for whom I have no other child care, um, I can request under the Families First Coronavirus Act a leave of absence um, to care for those children. It's at pretty reduced pay and it's for a limited period of time, but it's designed as kind of a stopgap until people can find an alternative. Um, we haven't seen a lot of those yet, um, but I think we will as we continue to march toward the hybrid model. And that's going to create some real challenges for us in terms of staffing. Um, so um, those are the two areas that kind of keep me awake at night as we're just finalizing the accommodations process and moving to this other really significant um, staff issue for us. Um, but I'm confident we'll, as we usually do, we'll figure something out. That's so, where we Kim, Just so the board understands the dimension, just at the elementary level, the need is somewhere about 72 faculty and um, we have accommodations to make, but we're going to have to make other selections, obviously. Um, it, it, and I think the point we've made to the board, and I would like you to hear, when we started in September, we kept the assigned teachers. This, what we're speaking to for those online learners, which exceed 4,000, will probably have a different teacher. And we, we, we've, um, we've said that to folks, and I don't see any change in that at this point. It's been a yeoman task to trying to line them up. And with the going back and forth, it just further exacerbates our challenges. And um, so we're, as Kim says, we're working through it, but it has been um, very difficult to say the least because of the size of the district. So uh, thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Madam Chair, I have a question. Go, go ahead, Joe. Uh, I don't know whether this is for Kim, for Dr. Sal. Maybe this is just a crazy notion. In terms of the problems with subs, and I can imagine that is going to be an enormous problem for everybody because we ask our subs to do a lot and they don't get paid a lot. And there's a lot of challenges this year. I know our schools all have building subs. Would, we, would it be a solution? Would it be possible? Would it help if we added a second building sub? In some of our build, you know, our buildings, or Absolutely. a third, if you're talking to high school or the middle school, I don't know whether that the model works or the costs work. It but maybe that's an easier way to get somebody in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think you know that's one that we're looking at, not just for kind of incidental subs, but also if we have to cobble together for these intermittent leaves. Right. Um, we want to try to have the same person in if we can. Um, the high school, I want to say, has three or four building subs and a whole cadre of interns that we also use for that in that capacity. Um, the middle schools, at least Rogers Park, I know is going to have some of these NYU interns as well. Um, and I, I do think we have looked at that model and will continue to do so of putting in some more at the elementary level because um, we're certainly going to be able to keep them busy. Um, sure. 
going to be a question of finding and retaining. So if you know anybody, <laughs> <laughs> you have a little free time. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just I did uh, just mention I was asked to produce um, a document for the board and I have a draft uh, for you and also we're hoping at the next meeting uh, Kara who's and her team who have just been I just can't tell you the work that they're doing I'm just so proud of them um, are going to do a presentation on the DL for us and uh, it'll take some time but she's working on that for for the next meeting um, with that that's all I have at this point thank you. Then, Madam Chairman, do you want me to move into the CIC? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have Chip here. Um, you know, I think you've gotten some questions from some community members and you've been reading the papers. I have sent a letter uh, to, I'll let Chip talk about it uh, today, but Chip, would you update the board what's going on with the CIC, particularly the sports that um, are in question? Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Sell. Good yeah. evening. Good evening, board. Um, it's been quite interesting from a, a athletic high school athletic standpoint for us. Um, if you've followed in the, along the newspaper or the governor, everybody up to the governor as uh, his uh, his right hand person, uh, the DPH, all talking about football. Uh, ultimately, football in the state of Connecticut has been canceled as we know it for the fall, uh, and there is. Uh, movement right now to try to uh, move football to the spring in a reduced schedule. Uh, in the meantime, football for us, football for local schools, uh, they're, they're allowing what's called 7v7, which is a low risk, immediate risk activity um, with games. There's no really no contact involved with that. Uh, but it would give our coaches and, and kids the opportunity to remain with having some instruction and keeping moving forward uh, along with the football program. As far as our other sports, uh, we have all other sports moving in the right direction. Uh, as Kara and Kathy mentioned, uh, there was a time in March, I'm sorry, in August, where we were, uh, we had to shut down the athletic program. We shut it down for about 25 days. Uh, we were allowed to restart it. Uh, on Friday, September 11th, and we've been going every day since. Uh, we have somewhere around the neighborhood of 400 to 450 athletes training every day. This week is the first week uh, we were allowed to train athletes in full teams. Prior to that, we could only train in cohorts of 10. So teams now are training together. Uh, if you come up to see us, our team's working out, uh, we are required to wear masks to and from the activity. Uh, we are required to social distance when the kids are not actively involved in, in the activity. Um, you know, for, for the most part outside seeing the mask, it's uh, the masks on the kids and the coaches. It's really great to see the kids having some fun and uh, getting along like in some type of normalcy. Um, we are scheduled. We follow what's called CIAC guidance. Uh, medical guidance, working closely with Kathy and Kara on that. Uh, so uh, we follow exactly what they're telling us. We're allowed this week to scrimmage, which is Saturday. Uh, we play, we're going to be playing games in what's called regions. So we're going to play in a small region. Instead of playing across uh, the county in 18 schools, we reduce that to five. In the event there's a uh, issue with COVID, we can contact Trace much quicker. All schedules have been reduced. Um, as an example, girls soccer may play 16 games normally. Uh, this year, they're playing 10. Uh, we anticipate starting all the fall games in the regular season, uh, October 10, October 1st. It will go about approximately five weeks. Uh, there is questions with the winter programs. Uh, we don't know how that's going to unfold, but for, for this point, we're, we're kind of moving along at a nice steady pace. Uh, we just knock on wood every day and we, we we were blessed every single day that the kids get an opportunity to be out there. So that's how we're looking at it. And we're just going to keep moving forward. Thank you, Chip. Uh, okay. I just have one question for Chip. Chip Go, Kathy. If, if, um, if football moves to spring, what does that mean for other 
spring sports that they're going to be using the field, where would other sports be using? Well, the, the idea, Kathy, behind that, and that's been part, that's been part of the, the, uh, uh, the debate, but what they would like to do with football is place it in what's called an inner season. It would start in late February in oh, end, colder. Okay. and end in April. And the idea would to push back the spring activities about two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it would not impact any of the spring activities Got it. Um, other than just moving some things around to make it uh, equal. Great. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Chip, I have a question how, about how many football players play another sport. Do we know the answer to that? Or specifically play a spring sport? In our, in our program, um, we we probably have about 50 to 60 percent playing other sports. The remaining kids are active. They're conditioned. They condition year-round, oh, strength training, sure. and do the whole thing. But about 60 okay. percent of those kids will play okay. on those. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Chip. If there's no other questions, we'll move, uh, Madam Chairman, I can move to facilities. Information. Is that okay? Okay. Um, uh, um, Courtney? Thanks, Dr. Take the board quickly? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll be brief. Um, so we've gone through all of the building reentry safety plans. Um, as we mentioned in the last board meeting with each, each of the buildings, we're in the process of establishing um, a safety committee for the administrative buildings. Um, and um, staff is in the buildings. We have administrators, the um, custodial staff, the safety advocates and, and teachers have been invited to return back to the building um, for this week um, at their choice. Um, and they're safely distanced. They've all been trained in the safety of wellness. And as Kim mentioned, thanks to you know her team's efforts at working with Rich and making accommodations to the staff people, from what we hear, feedback are are feeling pretty comfortable with um, being in the schools um, right now. And we also, as Kathy mentioned, have the directional signage down, and we plan to do some additional visits next week as we have a better picture of what it will look like with um, students returning for a hybrid, whether it's a partial return, as Dr. Sal mentioned, or something different, so we can be just ready to go with everything we need. Um, so that's a brief facility update. And then in addition, um, Dr. Sal and Rich Ginelli asked that I put together for you a spending update on our COVID-related or pandemic-related spending. And that's, um, I'm not going to pull it up on the screen now. You have that in your board packet. And um, unless somebody would like me to um, when we go through the Q&A, but broadly speaking, it's how I normally have been presenting things to you, which shows on the top, we're showing the expenses, um, which is the, this is projected expenses. So it's about $7 million. And on the bottom, we're showing the resources, which are the different funding streams associated with um, our, in, our coronavirus related spending. And so what this is, is the it's it doesn't include the alliance money so you'll recall before we shared with you like a braided funding that looked at what we were going to be spending overall for the whole budget this year and rich asked that i just focus for this purpose on the coronavirus spending and to break it down in categories so you can see what we spent last year or and then what we spent or are projected to spend this year in categories of you know online instruction for example social emotional supports uh, adhering to health, so all the extra sanitizer disinfectant that we had to buy, what we're projecting to spend with custodial staff, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I'll just pause to see if anybody wants me to pull that up or if you have questions. I see Kate has one. I just have a quick question, Courtney, and it's it's just a point of clarification. Under the adhering to health category, I noticed that the total is 700,000, yes. 110, uh, sorry, yeah. 10,898. But there's 10,000 listed for one year, and then the, the full amount is listed for the 2021 school year. Yeah. Is that just a. I, co um, I corrected that, and I'll, I'll have Kara send that around. Yes. The total is it just. Is, yeah, the total is correct. It's 710, and the amount in 2021 should have been 700, 898. Okay. And Perfect. so I'll take that a correction. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Okay. It's that, and I, I meant to mention that. So, so what we're doing this, I'm. 
I think I, we sent you a copy of a letter. We are going to ask for some backup funding. Uh, um, there was a grant that was put out that um, that um, was miscommunicated to all the districts, not just us. And we're hoping that um, the districts that overestimated uh, are not going to be reimbursable, therefore leaving resources for some of the districts like ours that should be entitled to more. I also want the board just to think through, we believe the executive order is still in. We're carrying our bus drivers and our, our um, cafeteria workers um, at this point. So um, that, that is uh, an expense we're carrying that we have to look at uh, closely. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to look for some backup money to, to help us out. So um, I'm sure we'll hear more as we're going through. Right, Courtney? Yeah, Dr. Salomon, and I, I, I just wanted to add one brief thing. This doesn't include this doesn't include anything unanticipated, right? So this is just what what we know as of today that we need. So, for example, Kim mentioned the um, Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, this doesn't include a cost estimate associated with that. This is assuming that with our existing staff, we'd be able to accommodate that. So as those, you know, new situations arise and we get more information, we'll, we'll brief the uh, board on what changes in our funding picture. This is just, this is what it looks like today. And, and like Dr. Sal mentioned, it doesn't include the cost associated with feeding families, which we do see a revenue gap every month. We're feeding our families because we, we it's important um, and we are continuing to employ all of this, the, um, the uh, cafeteria workers, and that's an expense. And our revenue is lower because we're feeding less families than we would were we fully everybody in school. Courtney, a question is, so, so what we're looking here, this is, would I be correct in this, in, in concluding, this is a pretty good summary of the new things we approved in June that we weren't thinking about in February that it really summarizes in this document. Exactly. Yes, exactly. This is, it includes the, what the CARES Act funding that we were awarded that state coronavirus relief fund that um, Dr. Sal just mentioned that may be adjusted upwards. If we, it turns out we have additional sub needs, you know, things like that. The city reserve money that we rolled over for emergency that the city agreed and then a small portion of the grant carryover from some underspending last year. So it's all of those things exactly, Joe. It's the things that um, were not contemplated in the budget that we're spending as one time, you know, expense on coronavirus related um, activities. So we're, we're spending, in, in lieu of some of the things we were intending to do in February, we're now spending this money on that stuff. Uh, replace, replace some of those programs with COVID spending. Right. Correct. This is an update. Okay. Yeah, based on what we found out we needed. So for example, desk shields for um, all of the pupil, right. you know, one to one or, or face to face work that are, um, yeah. we're doing with special needs students, for example, we had to buy some additional science tables, for example, things like that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. That's all we have. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, Courtney, this is kind of a little off topic here, but um, speaking of school lunch, did anything change? We had three schools that were not receiving the free um, lunches. Did anything change with those three schools this year? So, yes, um, we're in the process. Um, we're still collecting the information for those, those schools, but we believe we're going to be approved for CEP. It's just we're in the final phase of getting the approval with the state. So it, it, I'm like 99% sure I'll be able to report to you at the next board meeting that those three schools are now also CEP schools, which, you know, gives us a little more flexibility. Yes, great. And Thank more you. revenue. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Gladys. Next, uh, before I do my report, uh, chairperson report, do we have any committee that would like to report tonight? Uh, I know Mr. Uh, Watson did citywide PTO. Uh, Rachel and Kate, you are representative from the board. Do you have anything additional that you want to share with us? I just have one thing. I don't know if it reached anyone. Um, there was um, a mention at the meeting 
that um, the Spanish translation of our meetings was not exactly um, accurate. And I, I don't know if anybody heard that on this end. No, I didn't. Perhaps we could address that at some point. Okay. Um, you mean the broadcast, Rachel? Yes, the, the Spanish translation of it. Okay. I, 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 we could say that might be what we do from uh, uh, from the, the Hatters TV, I think. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll check. Do I have a through. committee? Okay. Uh, my report is uh, short. Uh, I have a goal to hope that we can be done with our board meeting at least by the night. Um, I personally want to thank uh, Nick Russo and all the board members that participated in the workshop last week when he went over the roles and responsibility of board members. Uh, I think it was an excellent session and I hope uh, within the coming uh, year of 2021 that uh, we will continue to have uh, these sessions because it's very informative. In the month of July, August, as a board and as a community and parents, some of us are parents, grandparents, uh, we felt that it was very important to keep uh, the community informed. And we can, we had meetings in the month of July in August. And uh, to just really uh, keep the, the community informed and the issues that were concerning education. And uh, things were changing so rapidly, um, most of us felt that that was a good idea. And I certainly appreciate you attending and being supportive of, of that initiative. Now, I feel like we're into September. We're back into our mode uh, of board meetings. And I really don't want us to get lazy because we have a lot of things that we are working on. We have the summit. We have Auburn Street. We have hopefully some type of budget, something coming up, uh, and we want to be able to be efficient and and move things forward and, and not be here all night if we continue doing um, this viral. So uh, what I'm trying to say is I had thought about certain comments that were made about um, comments and how long it took for the comments to be made and I thought about it quite a few nights and we decided to do what we used to do at our regular board meeting is to uh, have the comments, go ahead and read them, but we're going to stop at three minutes, just like we're at our regular board meeting in person. So we will start our board meeting at seven o'clock and we're going to end public participation at seven thirty and be done with that. So we can move on and take care of the rest of our business uh, of the board. Uh, there might be some uh, other changes later on, but you know, I will always have that discussion with my board meeting members if we're gonna make a change, uh, that we will be able to at least let the community uh, know that we're going to make some changes. So tonight, uh, again, I want to thank Cindy for uh, reading our comments and uh, she does an excellent job and we can move forward on that. Um, the last thing I will say to board members, please, if you're participating in any type of discussion or communication, I speaking on uh, a, as a board member, just do the respect and let me know that you're participating because when people call me and said, you know, and Mary Jo was talking, and uh, even though, you know, uh, I was not a part of that communication and speaking engagement, just let me know. Uh, I have no idea who's speaking and where you're speaking. So uh, let's just work together, okay? Uh, that's all that I have to report. Uh, if seeing nothing else, i ask a motion to oh, move in. Can I ask a question before we, before we adjourn? Can I ask a question? I need a motion to move into executive session. Gladys, can I ask a question before we adjourn? Yes, right. Um, yes. I just want to yes. um, address. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I've been hearing from a lot of parents about the, you know, instructional time, and I brought this up at our last meeting, and it was day two of the school year. We're now in week three, and um, Kara, you'd mentioned, you know, when academics really start kicking in, you know, a full instructional day will be um, completed and maybe more. So, you know, so we're now in week three, and I feel like where is the asynchronous piece to go with the synchronous? Mm -hmm. um, our teachers are still training. Um, you know, can can you speak a little bit about like what's happening? <laughs> yeah. So you know, the the there's it's no secret that this has been a um, you know a, a fairly organized but difficult transition. So teachers are still trying to get a handle on delivering the lessons. Uh, I'll give you just two two different type of scenarios. At the K-5 level, uh, we have our, our coaches, our instructional coaches, kind of curating a lot of content for the teachers um, to use in their Google Classrooms that's organized. Um, we've prioritized standards so that we're making sure that with the time that we have with students that we're targeting um, the most important high leverage standards that we can, taking into consideration what, what went on in the spring and also where students are arriving in the fall. So, there's a lot to manage there uh, with just navigating the technology piece, um, kind of looking at standards in a little bit of a different way and then delivering these lessons um, and having to really understand them first before you can deliver them. So there's been a lot of planning and time needed to do that uh, mm -hmm. at the K-5 level. As far as the um, students are building stamina to stay online right now, particularly at the younger grades. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been a difficult transition for students as, as much as it has been for staff. So, um, you know, as, as time builds, um, we'll be able to give students more independent work. Um, it, and some are starting to do that now. So it may not be seen, particularly at the younger grades, you're not gonna see as much uh, there, but as kids start to get into fourth and fifth grade, then we start to hit middle school and up, you'll see more asynchronous work. Um, about, I guess I should have clarified. I guess I'm yeah. speaking more at the high school level. And, oh, sure. And yep. All of the flex time, you know, not, not just all of the Wednesday yep. in the afternoons of Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Sure. So um, let's talk about edgenuity. So mm -hmm. we have had um, a big a portion of, uh, of time that we wanted to make sure that kids were uh, engaging in not just the synchronous, but the asynchronous. We believed worse was going to come from edgenuity, and we still believe that um, edgenuity has been... Uh, we have been working with them to get our integration up and running. Um, we had our first training session on September 16th. We originally had a training session uh, set for teachers to go much earlier in the school year. So it was kind of part of that uh, front loading professional development. However, when we switched to distance learning, our entire schedule shift, shifted and we lost that training date. So when we rescheduled, we, the earliest date we could push out um, with integration was September 16th. Concurrent with that, we've had tremendous integration issues with uh, and, and working with that company in particular because they have taken on over 500 school districts in the last 30 days. And so we've been in the queue with them working on getting our systems up and running. So um, teachers, as of just yesterday, our middle school students were, were locked and loaded into the system. Um, it took, uh, I can't even begin to tell you, uh, I think we're all still a little traumatized <laughs> from how many uh, appointments we've had with the engineers and the folks at, at, at Ingenuity to get it all up and running. So we are there now. Teachers will start to um, uh, work with this program and start to do a little bit more at the secondary level, which will fill in a lot more of the time that we spoke of earlier. Um, it's coming probably about two weeks later than we would have liked, um, but moving forward, you should see that. We also do like the fact that, that the the, the flex provides still that um, opportunity for students to get more support um, as mentioned by the the two students who were on on uh, on earlier um, it is you know depending on what your what your needs are you still have that opportunity but the the asynchronous work will come teachers are still kind of just working out the in-person synchronous piece and that part will come with time but having the right tools to do that is everything and that's a piece at the secondary level that ingenuity will help to fill as we go forward so more to come. More to come. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Are there any, any other questions, concerns? See if not, 
I need a motion to incomplete second session. Second. Motion made by Al, seconded by Jeff. All in favor? Can I hear aye? Aye. 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 Motion so carried. Do we need a break?